Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I think it, just as a starting point, uh, we look at all these institutions and we look at the dramatic changes in the world in the last 10, 15 years, I think it's probably appropriate for all, all of these dialogues or institutions to step back and say, are we operating in a way that's, that's reflective of the global economy? Is our mandate, as we once understood it, still appropriate going forward? Uh, in my view, the G20 has taken on growing significance. Uh, where Secretary Paulson and I were there in November last year. It was a critical time of what was going on in the financial markets, and it was an incredibly useful forum, and I think continues to be even a more relevant forum for some of these critical issues that I've outlined. Uh, in the case of G7, uh, in our view, the G7 have an important role, and there are some issues uh, that are unique or relatively unique to the G7 where it can play a, a, a very significant role, and let me come back to one of those. And then there are many other issues where the G7 will need to very actively do outreach and bring other countries into the fold to have the G7 discussion be meaningful. So uh, let me give you two examples briefly. Current financial market turmoil. Uh, the, the G7 has interacted throughout the last six months on a formal and an informal basis. And the countries that have been affected by this are primarily, primarily the countries around the table. So the Europeans, uh, the Japanese to a lesser degree in the United States. And, the, and that has been the right group of folks to talk about some of the issues around the FSF, to talk about some of the things that uh, the FSF should be focused on, to talk about near-term actions that individual countries are taking to deal with the financial market turmoil. It's been absolutely the right audience and the, the right group, and it's been very useful. Uh, there was an issue uh, that came up last fall, which was the issue of sovereign wealth funds. And the G7 in that case recognized that, well, we can have a discussion with seven of us in a, in a room, but if we don't open that discussion and bring other countries into it, uh, it's not going to be very meaningful. And so that was the basis for a great deal of outreach that happened to sovereign wealth countries and a number of other multilateral institutions to think about a way to deal with uh, some of the concerns that have been raised around sovereign wealth funds that was measured and targeted and didn't feed the forces of protectionism. So. Uh, for the time being, I, I think the IMF has demonstrated, or the uh, G7 is demonstrating that it plays a very relevant role, and I, I think it needs to be very mindful of continuing to evolve to ensure that's the case. Uh, Ernie Freak, Manufacturers Alliance. Uh, first, let me thank you, Mr. Undersecretary. It was very encouraging to hear where, where we're going these days, the U.S. leadership and others. Uh, in these new circumstances, it has to be basic reform and a focus on exchange rate policy. Uh, but in these new circumstances, one issue, very fundamental issue for an international organization that's going to function effectively, and that's the relationship between obligations and enforcement. Uh, for example, UN Security Council, violations, ultimate sanctions, WTO, dispute settlement procedure, the last resort if the obligations are violated could be a trade retaliation. And the IMF, it was always straightforward. Somebody wants a loan, they meet the conditions, or they don't get the loan. But in these new circumstances with misaligned or manipulated currencies below or guidelines and practices for sovereign wealth funds, uh, there doesn't seem to be any enforcement mechanism within the IMF in the new circumstances. It's everything sort of voluntary. Or if you're, you're found a misaligned, well, the country can say, well, maybe, but uh, the next several years we, we really can't do anything. Uh, so is the IMF, under the new circumstances, exchange rate <coughs> policy center stage, is it kind of a, uh, a toothless tiger? Yeah, th thanks uh, for that question. Let, let me make two points on that. The first is uh, on those two issues you raise in particular. Uh, I think there is an enormous value uh, in the IMF bringing rigor, specificity, and clarity to these questions because with those three things, um, there's an enormous amount of market pressure, market broadly defined, uh, because the IMF is a credible multilateral institution, has come, come forward and worked with others to identify uh, a particular finding in one of those areas. That in and of itself, in, in my estimation, has significant value, significant signaling, uh, significant uh, implications for countries involved, uh, significant implications for, uh, for our various countries in terms of how we respond. So that's a value. Uh, the question you raise is a, is a legitimate one. Uh, should we be thinking about that as the IMF continues to evolve its mission? Probably, and uh, I, I think you've raised good questions, but I don't want to underestimate or undervalue the benefit of just the IMF being clear and concise on some of these toughest issues. 
Dr. Weiss with Congressional Research Service. Uh, regarding the sovereign wealth fund debate, uh, you know, we saw some of the comments that Simon Johnson made at Council of Foreign Relations last week about, and then also kind of talking about voluntary practices and whatnot. What do you think we could expect to see uh, regarding sovereign wealth funds and in the near term, at least, at least here, what we could hear from the, from the fund uh, at the spring meetings? What types of guidelines are we going to see in uh, the, at the annual meeting next year? And again, are, are we going to be able to get to the point, at least on sovereign wealth fund, to be able to have the IMF come up with some type of guidelines that are kind of clear, concise, easy to tell whether a country is meeting them or not without the kind of the wiggle room that we have with the exchange rates? And then, if that's the case, will the IMF have any type of <coughs> punitive, either uh, you know, slap on the hand, bad actor type uh, statements in Article 4s, or is it going to be kind of more of the same, the IMF kind of wanting to let the national governments make those statements and not have the IMF there? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what we'll see specifically in the spring meetings or, or, the, uh, or the fall meetings. These are, these are very much... Uh, work streams that are underway. Uh, I think just as a, a, a backdrop for this, the kinds of things I think we would hope to see is much more specificity and clarity around the objectives of funds, the governance structure, the risk management processes, uh, the investment thesis, the investment objectives. Th 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 these sorts of insights, I think, would uh, begin to allay some of the concerns, I think, which, which the evidence would suggest are largely unfounded. Uh, by many of the recipient countries. And so uh, that is, would be a real step forward. I think our, our sense is also that we have an alignment of interest here uh, where uh, while there's a lot of sensitivity around this issue, the countries that are the recipients of sovereign wealth investment largely want that investment to continue. And the sovereign wealth funds that uh, want to invest want those markets to remain open. And so we, we absolutely do have an alignment of interest. and. Uh, I'm, I'm perhaps uh, more optimistic than some, but I think that, uh, that we'll see a conversion of those interests in a way that results in something that's useful. And uh, once we have that, uh, I think the market then begins to play an important role. And uh, uh, again, uh, if you start with the premise, as I do, that uh, these funds have a track record and are largely commercially driven uh, investors, uh, that then this best practice set of guidelines just allows them to validate uh, the behavior that's already underway. And, uh, and and that becomes a very useful market mechanism. Uh, speaking of best practices guidelines, uh, Pedro. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I thank you for a very uh, meaty speech and congratulate you on it. I'm going to ask you uh, two questions, not on sorrow wealth funds, uh, one of which may be uh, general and, uh, and easy, and the other one should be uh, specific and maybe not one you want to answer, but I can ask it anyhow. Uh, I would expect nothing less, Dad. Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not Fred Bergstrom, but I, uh, I, I'm, a pale, I'm a pale, a pale uh, reflection of him. Uh, what the, the, the general question is to try to get you to say something about urgency. This process has been going on for two and a half years now. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, the U.S. has been uh, in the forefront of pushing IMF reform. Uh, you referred to a former finance minister, now prime minister, new ideas about what could be happen in this area. Is there some risk uh, that uh, this process will be uh, derailed into uh, endless uh, discussion? Uh, or put the other way, what do you see as the urgency of, uh, of the meetings, both this spring and next fall, in terms of the uh, IMF reform uh, agenda? Uh, the, the specific question is, I noted, um, uh, sitting next to Ralph Bryant back here, uh, that uh, in your comments about uh, uh, the quota reform issue, uh, you uh, mentioned the question of the size of the, uh, of the increase. Uh, one, as far as we know on the outside, uh, the number that has been talked about was in the area of 10 to 12 percent. Uh, anybody who does their uh, back, gets their envelope out, does a little calculation, says that the United States share is going to stay at 17 percent, approximately you're going to eat up a large chunk of that. And you actually can't achieve a substantial redistribution of uh, quota increases, uh, quota, change, uh, quota voting shares, uh, in the context of an overall increase of the 10% range. So are you telling us that the United States is now pushing for something uh, that's like double the 12% uh, that uh, you guys have been talking about in the past? Thank you. 
Okay. All right, Fred. Uh, remind me of the first question again. <laughs> urgency. Uh, let me spend let me spend a significant amount of time on urgency. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I do think there's a moment here. Uh, I, I, I uh, wouldn't want to say uh, that if this moment passes that reform won't happen, but I do think there's a moment here, and I think the managing director feels like that moment is here as well. And you've got this confluence of a number of different components of the reform, and that was actually the genesis for this speech was as we were sitting around Treasury talking about all these different pieces, and you sort of step back and think, wow, these threads are really coming together uh, or not uh, in the coming you know, three to six months. And, uh, and so I do think there's an important moment. You have a new managing director with a, a full head of steam who I think has the, the support of the members. I think you've got a lot of the analytic work has been done. There's not a lot of new things that are going to be cooked up. This is a matter now of, of political choice and trade-offs. And uh, I think there's a recognition that we need to get on with it. And so I'm hopeful that we'll get on with it. And, uh, and we're very committed to doing so. And I think, as I said, this next three to six months is a, is a critical time period. And you know, I think the managing director, uh, I don't want to speak for him, but my sense is he recognizes that uh, all of this is easier uh, uh, early in his tenure. And so he's pushing forward with a, with a lot of energy and, and we want to support that as much as we can. Uh, you know, I, on, on your second question, uh, obviously, there's a lot going on uh, uh, in terms of, of, of trying to find a path ahead here. I would simply say that uh, one could make the case, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you are, Ted, but one could make the case that unless it's a certain amount, X, Y, or Z, whatever that might be, we should forget it and, and, and not move forward. And I, I, as I tried to lay in, out my case, I, I think there is absolutely a threshold where this has to be meaningful a meaningful shift in quota, a meaningful redistribution. But uh, I think we also need to recognize that this is gonna, this is gonna be a process that, that goes one step at a time. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, we're trying to figure out where that needle gets threaded, where it's significant enough and to, to be meaningful and to build confidence that we're moving in the right direction, but also politically viable. And, uh, and obviously, if, if, if that point had already been determined, this deal would be done. So that is what it's really all about. It's threading that needle. And I'm you know, guardedly optimistic that'll happen in the coming months. Mike Cousin. Yeah, I guess I have a couple of comments with, uh, strikes me in listening to your remarks that uh, I found them interesting and forward looking, but also to some extent, orthogonal to the truth and to the law. Um, that after all, the fund by its formal constitution has no role in international capital books. It's just not part of the fund's mandate at all. I mean, it can serve, of course, as a forum for the discussion of uh, these issues, and it could, in that context, agree on a code of conduct. But the fund couldn't possibly enforce it. It simply doesn't have the legal mandate in that area, really, at all. And to suggest that it might in that way, I think we'd have to go to the Congress, get an amendment of the articles and get them to approve it, uh, or you're just uh, uh, blowing in the breeze. Uh, so voluntary forum, yes. Compulsory fund in force, no. On exchange rates, the situation really is quite different. There is Article 4. Sam Cross was uh, involved in the drafting of, of, uh, of Article 4, and it gives the fund date, the fund, members specific obligations under that article and the fund specific authority under that article. And the problem is that the fund has not been doing its job. I think largely because the membership led by the United States has not wanted the fund to do that job. And indeed the problems with China and so forth, one could and I do point to the failures of the fund in terms of providing leadership. But the United States government led by the US Treasury has been an important impediment to moving forward forcefully on uh, this issue, along with uh, other members. So it's going to be a question of whether the membership can get its act together and support a fund that's going to be more effective uh, in uh, uh, this area. Now, a much smaller point, uh, you mentioned the executive board, its structure, number, and so forth. 
Um, if the European Union or the Euro area reaches the point where they agree on a single representative, then I think shrinking the executive board is, is a good idea. Until that time, however, it seems to me you don't have a zero-sum game under your proposal. You have a negative-sum game because you want to eliminate four executive board seats. And how that's going to make it easier to solve the problem sort of surpasses uh, my understanding. So you might explain uh, how that's going to be uh, helpful uh, in uh, this uh, context. Finally, you spoke to the problems of the operation of the executive board. Um, of course, I had a fair bit of experience for 10 years with that. The executive board was expanded uh, to uh, 24 from 22 members in the early 1990s. Fund was very busy in the 1990s with the transition uh, of Central and Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union with the emerging market crises and so forth. It's perhaps therefore understandable that the volume of paperwork going to the executive board went up not because there were two more members, but because there was much more business to be done. Well, business is way off. <laughs> Paperwork continues to expand. <laughs> Suggest to me that the number of board seats is not the source of the paperwork problem. When we had a deputy managing director, Mr. Erb, and a fund secretary, Mr. Van Houten, who tried to exercise rigorous discipline on the number of papers that would go to the board, paperwork was kept down. In the period in which discipline has become much more lax, paperwork has continued to expand. We don't need to change the number of members of the board. The board and the management said we need to get its act together and tell the staff, cut back uh, on the amount of paper. It's clearly not helpful to the institution in terms of its function. But I don't think it requires any deep reform other than uh, the board and management and the staff doing their jobs best. Thank you, Mike, for those constructive and encouraging comments. <laughs> I, uh, let me, t let me t take on each one of those just very briefly. Uh, on the, the issue of surveillance, uh, you heard it here. We're, we're supportive of the surveillance program. I actually would dispute the uh, uh, thesis that we've been an impediment to the implementation of the surveillance uh, uh, point. I think what you're referring to is maybe the fact that we said models alone are not the only uh, potential uh, factor that would contribute to uh, an FM designation or should be factored into assessing uh, of the exchange rate, uh, but uh, make no mistake about it, we've been, uh, I think, the leading driver of the surveillance program putting in place. We want the IMF to do its job, and we think the IMF doing its job in surveillance is what I just described. Uh, with regard to the executive board, I didn't mean to suggest that by trimming back the number of seats that we would inevitably eliminate paperwork or bring the strategic focus. I think there's uh, several points I was trying to make. One, it's, it strikes us as a little bit orthogonal to um, treat uh, the IMF staff reductions and reform completely separate from the executive board. Let's take on the executive board issue right now, too. It's an important issue. Uh, we think that it's too big, uh, it's too unwieldy, and that there is some benefit in streamlining. Uh, my my understanding was, and my thought was that by uh, created uh, by eliminating the appointed seats and potentially creating elected, you all of a sudden have a different set of possibilities from a representational model standpoint to satisfy some of the European concerns in terms of who's representing whom. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that'll be an easy issue, uh, but again, back to the point around let's not avoid the tough issues as we talk about this reform agenda. It strikes me as, as, as this should be uh, very much on the agenda. And we'd like to have it as part of the agenda uh, as we talk about a broader discussion around quota reform. Okay. The author of the famous uh, And I'm not going to talk or ask a question about that. Uh, first, thank you very much for what you said and what you said in answers to questions. Uh, you talked about uh, the fund's role in, uh, in, in maintaining financial market stability, and obviously that's very important. What you referred to were essentially measures of prevention, FSAPs and so on. Do you see, and if so, what do you see as being the fund's role in crisis resolution, and how would that fit in with the responsibilities of other agencies like regulators and central banks? Yeah, I think that's, uh, Andrew, I, I think I have more questions myself than answers on that, on that particular point, and by that I mean, 
uh, there are a variety of proposals potentially floating around in terms of the role the IMF uh, might play in early warning and, 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 and elsewhere. Uh, I, I think we need to see some of the specifics associated with some of those ideas. Clearly, as I said in my remarks, we believe the IMF continues to have an important role in uh, lending uh, in the event of uh, individual country crises. Uh, in the current situation, uh, the market turmoil that we're currently experiencing, the IMF has played an important role at the table with the, with the FSF. But whether there should be more to the role that is played, I, I think, remains open to question. Uh, and I th certainly think we're open to a discussion about that based on what Prime Minister Brown or others propose, but, uh, but we're certainly not advocating within the context of what I just said anything different than what I said. Uh, Morris Goldstein, Peterson Institute. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you rightfully uh, put a great deal of emphasis on exchange rate surveillance in the, uh, your view of the mission of the fund uh, going forward, and you were also hopeful that the new uh, surveillance decision announced last June would allow the fund, as you put it, to walk through the door. Well, we've now had about uh, seven, eight months of experience, and uh, I must say from the outside, I don't see much clarity. Indeed, quite the reverse. It looks like it's more muddled. There have been some discussions, I understand, before the board, but we don't have any rulings. We don't have any rulings about misalignment. We don't have anything about uh, manipulation. And in the China case, which I think most people were looking at as a test case of the ruling, we basically have nothing. The consultation uh, uh, happened a long time ago. I know it's not been completed, but it's, it's taken an interminable amount of time to get this out and, and settle it. So, uh, why are you hopeful? <laughs> I'm just a hopeful guy in general. I think that may be it. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm hopeful because I think there's, an, there's a recognition uh, of some of what you say. And by that I mean this was a fairly significant decision eight months ago. Uh, and now uh, the time has come to ensure that that decision is being implemented. Uh, in a rigorous way, in a way that, 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 that is truly meaningful. So I think the managing director understands that, and I, I, I think many at the IMF understand that, and I think the next six to 12 months will tell us whether that is in fact true. But uh, I did not mean to suggest that we're, we are comfortable in where we are in implementing that decision. There's, a, there's a, candidly a great deal of work to be done. To, uh, to maybe uh, put a slight different nuance than my colleague did, done, um, one can observe on the ground, so to speak, that over the last few months, the Chinese have permitted the renminbi to appreciate at a considerably faster pace than it had here before. Do you see any link between that action on the ground and the international process, which, well, as it is, has been kind of ratcheting up the sense of international community, including the European joining the U.S., as I said before, India, Mexico, other developing countries joining the core, perhaps encouraged to some extent by the IMF process. Do you see any relationship among those different strands of the development? Yeah, I'd like to believe there's a confluence of events with some of the very candid uh, conversations and prodding on the part of the United States, the active and growing engagement of the Europeans. Uh, I think the active engagement of the IMF and I think a growing recognition within China uh, of the importance of moving to a market-driven currency to, to manage some of their own internal challenges, Fred, as you and I have spoken about, and the risk of growing inflation. And uh, so, so uh, you know, it's, it's some combination of, of that. There's no doubt. And I, I think there is something that's dramatically different than the United States uh, you know, ringing the bell on this or the Europeans ringing the bell on this versus a multilateral institution that goes through a very rigorous process and ultimately uh, comes to that conclusion, uh, if indeed the IMF does come to that conclusion at some point. So, uh, there, you know, this, uh, again, uh, to highlight what you said, Morris, I don't, I don't mean to suggest we're, we're happy with where things are in terms of, of implementing the overall surveillance uh, program, but I, but I do think in particular the existence of that has been supportive and helpful with the Chinese. Okay, anybody else? If not, we will thank the Undersecretary thank both you. for the 
important remarks. You have a very generous sharing of time and candor in answering your questions. We wish you the best of luck, and we'll be back to talk with it as it evolves. Thanks a lot.